Good evening. I'm Pam Wayman from the Smithsonian Associates, and I welcome you to this special evening featuring Tom Clancy and General Zini in discussion with Jim Bohannon on their new book, Battle Ready. If you are not currently a member of the Associates and would like more information about the wonderful programs that we offer, please feel free to stop in at the desk outside the auditorium and we'll be happy to discuss uh, membership benefits with you. Twenty years ago, Tom Clancy wrote The Hunt for Red October, which catapulted onto the New York Times bestseller list. Since then, he has established himself as a master at blending exceptional realism and authenticity, intricate plotting, and razor-sharp suspense. He has had an uninterrupted string of best-selling books through the years novels including Patriot Games, Clear and Present Danger, and Executive Orders, among many others. Mr. Clancy is also a master of nonfiction, Submarine, Armored Cav, Fighting Wing, Marine and Airborne, a series of guided tours of America's war fighting assets. One of his most recent accomplishments is the Extraordinary Commander series, nonfiction that looks deep into the heart into the art of war through the eyes of America's outstanding military commanders. Tonight's program presents his current work in this series, Battle Ready, written with the renowned Marine General Tony Zini, and available for signing in the lobby after the program. In a masterful blend of history, biography, and you are there immediacy, Mr. Clancy and General Zini review the evolution of the Marine Corps from Vietnam through the post-Cold War to the radically different post-9-11 military environment. General Zini joined the Marine Corps in 1961 and has held numerous command and staff assignments that include platoon, company, battalion, battalion, regimental, Marine Expeditionary Unit, and Marine Expeditionary Force Command. He was involved in the planning and execution of Operation Proven Force and Operation Patriot Defender in support of the Gulf. He was Commander-in-Chief of CENTCOM and Secretary of State Colin Powell's Special envoy to the Middle East. His abundance of awards includes the Defense Superior Service Medal, the Navy Achievement Medal, and he has received 36 unit service and com com campaign awards. He currently holds positions on several boards of directors of major U.S. companies. In addition, he has held academic positions that include the Stanley Chair in Ethics at VMI and the Nimitz Chair at the University of California, Berkeley. As an interviewer, there is no person better to bring out the incredible talents of Tom Clancy and General Zini than Jim Bohannon. He is a member of the Radio Hall of Fame, and his programs are heard on nearly 500 radio stations coast to coast. His nightly Jim Bohannon show of interviews is heard locally on WTNT weeknights, and his news magazine, America in the Morning, is heard locally on WJFK. Jim is the originator of Freedom of Information Day, observed each March 16th, the birthday of James Madison, father of the Constitution. He has won numerous awards, including the grand prize from the International Radio Festival. Jim has broadcast from Moscow, Paris, Tokyo, and national political conventions, and has taken calls on his program from presidents, entertainers, athletes, authors, and astronauts orbiting in space. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Tom Clancy, General Tony Zini, and Jim Bohannon. Thank you very much for coming out tonight, and uh, also I would thank very much the uh, cameras from uh, C-SPAN who are with us this evening, uh, A-SPAN and B-SPAN having been uh, already committed. <laughs> this is in many ways, uh, General, a look at your life through the military, uh, your experiences obviously placed in the context of the headlines of the day, and you were frequently right at the edge of those headlines. But now, with uh, the experience that you have, I I'm very curious what you would have said to the young lieutenant who was just starting that journey. If you could go back and talk to yourself, what would you say that you, young man, are about to undertake? I think uh, it wouldn't be much different than what I would say to a lieutenant today, that uh, 
the most important thing you do is uh, lead the men and women who wear the uniform of the United States of America. Don't become enamored with your airplane, your tank, or your ship, uh, or your occupational specialty. It's the role of leader that's going to be not only the most challenging, but the most important, and that you're entrusted with the greatest treasure this country has, its sons and daughters, uh, that are given to you and are willing to sacrifice uh, for their country, for their unit, for each other. And you will make decisions that will involve life and death. Uh, and you'll be well trained and capable of doing that. And I would also say to that young lieutenant that you have to ensure that you have a code and a set of moral standards that you will live by and live up to for the entire time uh, you bear that uniform. That would be my advice uh, to Lieutenant Zinni in 1960s or my son, Lieutenant Zinni, now Captain Zinni, uh, today. Tom Clancy, you have known many military people in the course of your illustrious writing career. What makes uh, General Zinni so special? Well, he's pretty smart. <laughs> um, <clears throat> the purpose of doing the Commander series was to explain to the American, the American people, such people as read my books, that the people we have in high command earned their way there by being bright and studious and courageous. And they really do care a lot about the kids under their command. You know, the Hollywood says that all generals are drunken Nazis. Well, they're not like that. And they really do uh, get weepy over the, the, the sergeants and the corporals and the privates under their command because they are responsible for these guys in the same way they're responsible for their own children. And they're good guys and they study their profession as a Professor of Surgery at Johns Hopkins studies his profession. These are serious professionals, and they know what they're doing. There's a passage in uh, Battle Ready that I think is worth reading. It's not too long, uh, because there may be lessons here, perhaps, for the, the military. This was from your time in Vietnam. The Vietnamese Marines were masters of field craft. The Vietnamese Marines traveled light. They lived off the land, partly out of necessity, partly out of the importance they placed on being light and mobile, like the enemy. This points out the most significant difference between the Vietnamese Marines and their American allies. Americans always took it for granted that the full might of America was behind them. Not only did they expect to get three squares a day, but American units always operated under the conviction that no matter what, they would somehow get bailed out and that American firepower would prevail. Sure, there might be an occasion where you got stranded for a while before help came, but eventually help was going to get to you, rescue, firepower, or logistics. The Vietnamese Marines did not have that certainty. They never knew if they were going to eat on any particular day. When they got in a firefight, there was no guarantee that the cavalry was going to come and save them. They knew they had to fight with what they had. Thus, they had no use for the heavy loads American soldiers carried and their carelessness with weapons and supplies. They were happy to do without the daily helo resupply lifts that gave away positions. The Vietnamese Marines were masters of make-dos and workarounds. They ingeniously prepared fighting positions, living facilities, early warning alarms, and many other needs from what was available in the bush. A premium was placed on quick reaction and agility on en enemy contact. They were well aware of these qualities in the enemy they faced. What are the lessons from that, and have we learned them? I think uh, what I saw with the Vietnamese Marines was the ability to uh, not only live off the land and make do with what you had, but understand that there are times when your unit uh, in and of itself will be all that you'll have on the battlefield, and you can't count on anything else. Uh, they were amazing and remarkable uh, individuals. We lived in the jungle for long period of time, periods of time with no... MREs or C rations, we lived off the land. And it was interesting for an American to suddenly realize that you had to allocate two hours a day to hunting and foraging for food. Uh, I left that tour at 123 pounds. I swore I would never be 123 pounds again. You know. uh, <laughs> but uh, you, you learned a lot about yourself. You learned a lot about uh, how much you can fend for yourself and how much you can do and what's around you uh, that can help you that you're not just you're not aware of when uh, the wherewithal to conduct war and to meet your your basic requirements is always provided for you. Tom Clancy, the knock traditionally on military hierarchies is that they are always prepared to fight the last war. In all the discussions you've had with military leaders during the course of your writing career, do you think that we, the American military, uh, have gotten over that? Are we prepared, or at least trying to be prepared, to fight the next war? Certainly at the operational level. I mean, he, he, these guys do think into the future, and, and 
my, my friend Freddie Franks, when he was commanding general training and doctrine command, you know, his mission was to look 20 years in the future and get ready for it. So, yeah, they do think about that. Now, the civilian leadership, they're not always quite ahead of the power curve, but that's where they're civilians. <laughs> how, uh, how much should we adhere to the notion of civilian control? It's very much a part of our, our whole concept. And then, of course, you, you hear that, that phrase that wars are too important to be left to the generals. Uh, the guy who said that was a French politician. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> If you, if you were uh, in a position to change all of that, would you alter the relationship of military to civilian control? No. No, it's part of the Constitution. That's the supreme law of the land. You don't sure. mess with the Constitution. But, it, I mean, the Constitution's been wrong before. We've changed it uh, 20 or 30 times. Uh, There's a mechanism for doing so, but I don't think this needs immediate correction. Okay. How do you feel about that? The, the, have, I mean, certainly we should maintain civilian control. I don't think that's an issue. But have there been times when you have just hit your head? Okay. That's the order. We'll follow it. General? Uh, first of all, I, I subscribe to the concept. I think it's important that uh, we have civilian leadership of the military. That's what we're all about. Uh, I, I would prefer that that civilian leadership be educated and understand what it is in uh, to commit our, uh, our military to action. Sometimes I don't think they understand uh, the ramifications of what they're about to do. Uh, oftentimes, the generals are, are, are accused of being too conservative, too cautious, uh, and that's fair. We are, uh, because we know the cost in the end, not just in casualties to our, our own people, but the effects of war. We also know that uh, military action isn't the answer in and of itself, and we can see that now playing out in Iraq. It's got to go beyond just a defeat of the organized resistance. Uh, I get a little antsy and worried when... Uh, and in the entire civilian chain of command, you can't find anybody, as my father, who was a World War I vet, said, hasn't smelled powder. Uh, I'm not saying everybody should, uh, but I like the idea that a few of them showed up when uh, some of us did. Uh, of course, yeah, amen. As a matter of fact, you, can, you can put me down for that as well. Uh, the majority of members of Congress, for the first time in decades, has never served in, in uniform. Uh, and of course, that's partially the reflection of a very good thing. We haven't been in a really, really big war for a long time. On the other hand, when you have people in Congress who are voting appropriations and uh, military base closings and what have you, uh, without that, that first-hand empathy, when you have uh, civilian leadership in the Pentagon, many of whom have never served in uniform, for whatever reason, uh, doesn't that take away from some of the understanding critical to making wise decisions about the military? Well, I think it can. Uh, I, I don't necessarily think that it is an absolute necessity. I've seen some excellent members of Congress and members of several administrations that, that uh, I've served under uh, that really and truly understood. Although they didn't have the personal experience, they were determined to try to understand what it was all about. Uh, you know, when we used to give every year testimony on the Hill, it was a requirement for all the service chiefs and the unified commanders to come once a year to provide testimony on the status of our organization and what our needs were. We would always make the offer beforehand to pay a personal call on a member of, say, the Senate Armed Services Committee or the House Armed Services Committee. It was interesting to me that there were a few senators and representatives that would always, without fail, take you up on that and spend hours from a very busy day in their office wanting to understand what was going on, what your command was all about, what your concerns or worries were. And it was interesting because there was no necessary, necessarily a tie between their district or their state and my command. I, I would find uh, senators and congressmen from places really remote, no association with Central Command, for example, but it was this personal interest in the welfare of the troops and what our needs were. And although they may not have served uh, in uniform, they developed a depth of understanding that made their judgments and decisions, I thought, excellent in, in our support. Tom Clancy, should we bring back the draft? Oh, you should ask Tony that. I. We, we have a, an awfully good military out there now. They're good kids. They train hard. They care about the mission. And we did, we, we did that uh, without a draft. Uh, by the same token, it would be nice if there were a few Harvard and Yale graduates in uniform. There is something egalitarian about the notion that everybody owes something back to their country. Uh, yeah, and you don't always do it by going through law school. Um, 
<laughs> that might be points against, actually, but that's the only well, lawyer I have, joke No, I have a son-in-law who's a Naval Academy grad who's now a lawyer. There's, I guess there's one in every family, but... Um, <laughs> But no, he made the mistake. I, I told him, don't go to nuke school. And he went to nuke school, and he decided he didn't want to boil water for the rest of his life. And he wouldn't be a real naval officer. And he said, sorry, you signed your soul away to the devil. Tough luck. So now he's a lawyer. Oh. Um, he's a good kid. <laughs> General, uh, certainly the military, and I've interviewed any number of officers, uh, current and retired, who are universal in opposing a return to the draft, and yet we now see commitments around the world, uh, and, and there's no sign that those are going to change as long as the uh, terrorist threat exists. Uh, we uh, don't have enough people for where we are now, and uh, who knows where we might have to be in addition tomorrow. We are extending enlistments. We are keeping people in the reserves and the guard beyond the active duty time that they thought they were going to have. We, in fact, are able to plug the gap that way now but aren't we down the road really uh, stabbing in the back uh, prospects of further enlistments when people find out exactly what the drill really is and it's not just three years or uh, weekends and a couple of weeks in the summertime. Isn't it going to be very hard to uh, replace those people in the future when uh, people who are prospective enlistees can look and see what happened to those before them? Well, I don't think we need a draft, certainly not yet. And I think that the all-volunteer force was created out of a lot of uh, hard work and out of the aftermath of Vietnam and developed into a highly professional, highly skilled military, the finest in the world, clearly. The, the issue with the all-volunteer force, to keep it representative, uh, representative of America, we draw from all strata of society, is to make sure that uh, the benefits, the quality of life, the family stability, the incentives like education and career development are there. Uh, I think we ought to look at reform for some aspects of our military and some aspects of what we do for our military members. For example, I would reform the manpower system. Those of you that may have been in the military know that you, know, you can look forward to a 20-year career. That's stupid. The Roman army had a 20-year career. That's because people didn't live much past you know, late 30s and early 40s. We now take a young man or woman that we invest a tremendous amount in and, and at, at 38, 40 years old, we say goodbye. Why? They're still young, they're still healthy. So you look at a military career, you look at having to have two careers and start one over again at midlife when, when you may be in your prime. Uh, why can't we keep someone around until they're 50, 60 years old like other, play, uh, other uh, businesses and, and institutions? Uh, why can't you stay in, in your grade in, uh, for eight years instead of three or 10 years and get multiple experiences if you had a, a, a career force and you had sufficient structure, not, uh, meaning units and, and the manning was right, and the pay and benefits and family life were stable, I think you can attract from all the strata and you wouldn't necessarily have the fear of uh, not bringing people in that uh, represented America from, uh, uh, you know, from maybe the, the uh, higher classes and, uh, and, and just limit it to people that are trying to use it as the only opportunity to come out from uh, uh, you know, maybe a rural, rural area that's depressed or an inner city or something like that. I believe we still have enough Americans that would serve. Uh, we just have to make it not only more attractive, but more personally rewarding. There are people of uh, disparate views on Capitol Hill from uh, uh, Chuck Hagel, the Nebraska Republican senator, to New York Democratic Congressman Charlie Rangel, who was support a return to the draft. Tom Clancy, let's say that we change the, the ground rules a bit and simply said everybody owes their country something. Not necessarily in uniform of the military, maybe in the health service, maybe the Peace Corps, maybe something like a renewed job. Maybe corps. a cop or a fireman. I mean, yeah, we, all owe, yeah. we all owe our country something. And you don't have to be a Marine to do that. I mean, a cop serves our country. A fireman serves our country. Now, exactly how you legislate that through the federal system, I don't know, but there are many ways to pay the country back. And a lot of the people who serve our country, they're, they're regarded as sort of the lesser professions. Well, if you need a fireman, he ain't, there ain't nothing lesser about him. If you need a cop, ain't nothing lesser about, there's nothing lesser about him either. But there, fundamentally, there's no way to succeed in America without serving the public somehow. Whether you're a cop or a fireman or you run a 7-Eleven, those business, business, businesses exist because they provide services the public wants. There are many ways to do that. There's a portion of this book that uh, 
it's not too pleasant, but uh, I'll read a part of it it's on page 102. I had, and this is uh, General Zinni, I had turned sideways to give the handset back to my radio operator, Lance Corporal Frankie, when I was hit. This was in Vietnam. Three AK-47 rounds at fairly close range, close enough to easily pass through my flak jacket. It felt like I'd been whipped across the side and back with a burning, hot, wet towel. I went down. As I rolled into a shallow erosion ditch, I tried to get a sense of what was happening. What was happening? Uh, well, like any firefight, a lot of confusion uh, and a lot of heroics uh, by uh, my Marines. And, uh, and, you know, your first job as a leader is to try to make sense out of all that and, and try to forget your own situation, which is a little bit difficult to do. Uh, but I was blessed with uh, great young officers as platoon commanders and great uh, staff and non-commissioned officers that were my senior enlisted. And uh, we took the hill and uh, took out two companies in North Vietnamese in the process. You were pretty badly hit. In fact, the medics twice a day would literally rip the bandages off your wound, the most excruciating pain you'd ever known. A wounded Lance Corporal nearby with typical Marine enlisted candor said, Sir, you're really bleeped up. You should see your back. I didn't want to see my back. <laughs> Do you still suffer the after effects of that? I mean, are, are a, a you... little bit. I mean, you know, the, the, the rehabilitation was great. I had the, what, who was touted to be the finest uh, surgeon in the Navy that uh, repaired me and patched me up and uh, allowed me to continue on in my career. That's, um, a, that's something we need to think about <clears throat> briefly. <clears throat> I mean, the guy who did the first of the Commander Series, Freddie Franks, he lost uh, his left leg below the knee as a major, stayed in to get, get his four stars. Another four star, I know Ed Burba, lost his whole upper GI. I mean, his whole upper GI system was amputated by some North Vietnamese machine gun. So these are people who have all paid a price. When they serve their country, it's at the peril of their lives. And, you know, Tony paid a price for that. And we need to remember little, little items like that because our, you know, our, the freedoms we have depend fundamentally upon people who are willing to put their lives in jeopardy to protect them. And our public servants, the, the people who specialize in what they call public service, and the rest of us called politics, don't always give these guys the respect they deserve except as a passing rhetor rhetorical flourish. There are some uh, very interesting stories that uh, uh, just are part and parcel of all that you experienced, in, including uh, uh, the end of the Cold War, and at one point here, I note that uh, you were in Moscow, you were in uniform, and you went on a shopping expedition near the U.S. Embassy, and you uh, were treated with very special attention, not realizing just how special. Your wife was very fond of collecting Santa Claus figures. You went uh, through the process of buying a Father Frost tea cozy, Father Frost being the Russian version of Santa Claus. You later discovered that you got a bonus with your purchase. What was that? Well, and Father Frost's uh, toy bag was a listening device uh, <laughs> that I wasn't smart enough to find, but my wife found it. And before taking it in to your superiors, you yelled into the microphone, the Cold War's over. Is that true? <laughs> I'm not sure anybody was listening at the other end. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> also, you had... KGB to was a pretty good outfit, when you think about it. I mean, they, they were good at what they did. The, the KGB? Oh, yeah, they were very good. Well, let me ask you about that a, a little bit, since the intelligence matters have come into the headlines this past day with the uh, resignation of George Tenet. Uh, I'll ask you both. How good was the KGB, and how good is their successor unit, whatever it is? Tom? Oh, God, they were superb. No, once I was at Nellis Air Force Base outside of Las Vegas, which is not a place you want to go in the summer. Uh, and they, uh, they, uh, there's a place there called the Petting Zoo. It's, it's a collection of Soviet weapons. They call it the Petting Zoo because the, the pilots would go there and touch the anti-aircraft guns, you know, wondering if something, something like this is going to shoot at them someday. And hang on the wall one of the hangars, uh, which we have a bunch of Soviet aircraft. And I only saw the, the ones they admit to having. The other half of the hangar they wouldn't let me into. I know it's there, but of course we're... They never actually saw it. And they had, they had a MiG-23 model, which was a swing wing fighter, had the same uh, swing wing design as the F-111. The KGB stole the F-111 design so faithfully that the same design that killed a few American test pilots killed some Russian test pilots as well. 
that is a real Xerox job. They, uh, <laughs> you know, the Soviets put a lot of effort and a lot of, uh, a lot of investment and a lot of good people into the espionage business, and they were damn good. Uh, a friend of mine used to run the Justice Department's espionage investigations. He said they were world class. So, fortunately, our guys are pretty decent too. And, and the, the Soviets were always playing with a handicap. Uh, their economic system didn't work. And you know, there, there's a book uh, that came out from Putnam uh, right around in the late 1980s, I think, uh, "Stepping Down from the Star." by a gal named Alex Costa. She was a Soviet PhD. Her husband was a consular official in the Russian embassy. And, uh, and you, you got to read the book to see what Russia looked like or what America looked like to Russians. It's kind of like taking a two-year-old to Disney World who has no concept that a place like Disney World exists. She didn't know what a disposable diaper was. The idea of buying a car was getting on a list for three years instead of walking into an Oldsmobile dealership. Oh, you want a station wagon? Fine, drive it home. And she goes, what? Or going into do, going walking into a giant, going through the produce section, and not even knowing what all the fruit were, much less seeing them, you know, ripe and ready to eat, all in one place at one time. They they the the problem the Russians had was their system didn't work, and they were propagandized to believe that our system didn't work. Arkady Shevchenko, the, the highest ranking defector we ever got, uh, died a few years ago. He was a boozer like most defectors. Uh, when he met Gorbachev, Gorby walked into the room and said, Arkady Nikolaevich, when you were in America, what evidence did you see of the way the capitalists used to keep down the working class? Now, Gorbachev was a well-informed Russian, a fairly progressive Russian, but even he was very provincial, very insular in his thinking, and they weren't prepared for that, which is why when KG would put an operation together, one of the guys in the operation would defect. And that was, a, that was a strategic problem for them. <laughs> I mean, it was a real problem. I mean, yeah, they didn't know. And they, it was, it was, America to them was Disney World, but they didn't know Disney World existed until they got here, and all they had heard about it beforehand was lies. The truth has a way of running the world once you recognize it. General? Uh, I'd like to say something about George Tennant since he resigned today because I have a special place in my heart for him. When I, I didn't know George before I was the commander of U.S. Central Command, uh, and I got a call one day and said, uh, the, the director of Central Intelligence uh, wants to come down to your headquarters. And I said, of course, you know, we're honored that he would come down. And he came down and said, uh, I'm here to check to make sure that we are supporting you, that you have everything you need. I want to understand what your needs are, what your requirements are. I personally want to stay connected to you. Uh, please tell me. Uh, what you need and if we're serving you uh, correctly. He then sat down with me and he said, help me understand the region of the world you're responsible for. Help me understand and see it through your eyes. I said to him, George, you're the director of Central Intelligence, you know everything. He said, no, I see the intelligence, but I don't know what filter to put that through or how to understand it. What do I need to know to look at what I'm receiving and, and, and get some sense of what it's about? And we had a long talk about Islam, about what it means to be an Arab. We had a long talk about Bedouin culture, about the history of colonialism, uh, about the desert and the geography. Because if you don't understand that, you couldn't understand the part of the world th that I held responsibility for. He then, he made several visits to my headquarters personally, asking that same question. He also asked me for a favor. He said, I would like you when you're in Washington to come by uh, the, the, the agency and sit down with my analysts that work your part of the world. And he said, all I want you to do is spend half a day and talk to them. Give them your impressions of people and events. Listen to their take. I want this interaction. And I have to say, I doubt that there was ever a director of central intelligence that made that kind of personal commitment and personal involvement out to military commanders in the field and then wanted them at his headquarters interacting directly with his analysts to make sure we all had it right. Uh, and it, he was remarkable in the support he gave us every time we took military action. You know, intelligence is not a perfect art, and we obviously have made some mistakes along the way, but we should not doubt that we didn't have a great American as a Director of Central Intelligence, and it's unfortunate that we've lost him because I know his heart was in delivering the very best for those that needed his products. 
Tenet says he's quitting to spend more time with his family. The White House <laughs> says they're very sorry to see him go. No, he was not pushed. Uh, Porter Goss, the chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, says no, he was not pushed. Former CIA Director Stansfield Turner says he was pushed. What, <laughs> what do you think? So I should have pushed Turner when they had the <laughs> chance. <laughs> no, I didn't say that to me. <laughs> Play that back. <laughs> what, what, what do either of you think in that regard? Uh, I mean, given the fact that uh, there were serious questions. He was DCI for seven years, and sometimes a cigar is just a cigar, you know? Okay, I can accept that. All right, let me talk to you a bit about uh, your service uh, during the first Gulf War and some time that you spent in Israel. And uh, you write here, there have been a lot of misconceptions about the Patriot missiles and their capabilities and about their perceived failures. Some reports even claimed falsely that they didn't work at all, as though all the Scud warheads got through untouched. Let's set the record straight. Please set the record straight. Well, I, I was a brigadier general in the European Command, and we had Patriot units that I didn't know anything about uh, the system because it was relatively new, but we, we brought them into Israel because of the uh, Saddam's sending scuds to uh, Israel. Uh, we had a number of U.S. batteries, a Dutch battery, and an Israeli battery. The Israelis were training up on the Patriots and had to rapidly field their, their capability before full training. Uh, there was a decision made that we needed a general down there. Uh, the Israelis were hell-bent to get involved in that war and to strike back. We didn't want them to for uh, obvious reasons. And they felt they needed a general down there to go around and be beat up by the Israeli generals. And I was nominated to be the, uh, the, the BT in, the, in that. And so while I was down there, I lived with the Patriot units. And uh, it was frustrating in many ways. It was a new system. We were just learning it. The system is designed for what's called point defense. In other words, you put it on an airfield or a position and it protects that position. It was never designed to defend a, a complex system of cities, Tel Aviv, Haifa, uh, an entire uh, large uh, urban area. So what happens is if it engages a missile out there and knocks it down, it's going to come down somewhere. Uh, it's doing its thing by making sure that place it comes down is not where the battery is located, but it's coming down in a built-up area somewhere. Uh, and uh, oftentimes uh, with deadly results. Uh, we had problems in the system that, uh, you know, when it was put on what amounts to automatic, uh, it would launch on atmospheric clutter. So we had to take it off automatic. The young lieutenants then had to manually operate it, handle it. Uh, Saddam Hussein was going through a, a, a set of science projects with his scuds. He was uh, taking them apart and uh, trying to increase the warhead or the range. These things would break up over Tel Aviv and Haifa. And in the beginning, all you saw on the, as little blips on the screen was this thing breaking up literally in just these uh, hundreds of little pieces. And the, the young lieutenants learned pretty quickly that, and they could see this with their eye, I couldn't, but they played the tapes back over and over again, and the warhead continued at the same velocity while everything else slowed up. And, what I, want, and I want to tell you, I couldn't see it slow up, but they could pick the warhead out in a matter of seconds and then engage it. And it was remarkable what they did. We learned a lot that improved the system later on in, in modifications and more advanced models. Uh, we had a tremendous support in there in that the Israelis uh, activate all their scientists when there's time of war, and they had created a place called the Scud Farm, and they actually went to the scene of impact and they picked up every single piece and almost overnight reconstructed the Scud, and in some cases our own Patriot. And they would do an analysis of this to try to understand what Saddam was doing. Added warheads or increased range or changing the fuel systems or whatever. And so it was a fascinating process to watch all this. But I think the, Scud, uh, the uh, Patriots got a bad rap. Uh, certainly there were some flaws in a new system, but they learned a lot, and, and basically those young lieutenants in those vans that engaged in those young troops that manned those batteries did a heck of a job uh, and, and did hit most of those coming in. Unfortunately, they had to come down somewhere. When the war ended, it should be noted that you were sipping coffee in a cafe in the old part of the city where you were specifically told not to be, right. correct? Yeah. Why were, you, why were you there? Uh, I, I was told by the ambassador that I was not allowed to go to Jerusalem uh, because obviously there was, uh, there was support in there uh, for Saddam Hussein. It was very sensitive. There was, might have been problems out there. He didn't want an American general out there, so he told me I couldn't go. Uh, I told my Israeli counterparts in the Air Defense Force that I wasn't allowed to go to Jerusalem. They became very angry. They said, uh, you know, uh, we can take you to Jerusalem. Uh, one of my jobs was to make sure they didn't get too angry. 
So I decided that, uh, I said, I'll go, but we have to keep this very quiet and low key. So uh, we drove out to Jerusalem. It was very, all the windows were shuttered. It was all uh, locked down. And uh, I visited the Dutch battery out there. And the uh, Israeli colonel said, well, let's go get a coffee at one of the cafes. And I said, not a good idea. He says, we'll go into the old city. Nobody will notice. We'll just quietly have a cup of coffee and we'll leave. So we went down to, and I had my, my battle dress uniform with my name and U.S. Marines on it. And we <laughs> sat down at the cafe to have a coffee. It was quiet. The, the owner came out. There was no one on the street. Uh, as we were enjoying the cafe, I heard this rumbling sound and then all this screaming and yelling and the windows and doors flew open and people were rushing out in the street saying the war is over, Saddam has surrendered. Unfortunately, amongst them was a CNN crew and uh, <laughs> immediately focused in on me and uh, I got a call from the embassy saying to go to my airplane and leave the country. So it was the only country I've ever been thrown out of by a <laughs> Tom Clancy, your, your books have a way of, uh, of seeing to the future, like that, that vivid scene of the 747 crashing into the U.S. Capitol. And uh, also, of course, uh, there was the, the book in which we had the Israeli nuke lost during uh, the 1973 war that wound up being used to, uh, in your book, I guess, blow up part of uh, Denver in the movie. Yeah, it was I part screwed, of Baltimore. Yeah, I screwed that up, yeah. Uh, <laughs> how close is that to a reality in your view? Uh, I later found out that at the beginning of the, of the uh, War of Atonement in 1973 that the Israelis did go on nuclear alert. Now, whether or not the bombs were actually attached to airframes, I don't know, but they, they lit up their nukes. Uh, fortunately, they didn't, they didn't use any of them, but they, were, they went hot on the nukes. I, I bring that up because I would have to ask you it during a later period, the, the Gulf War, the first Gulf War, uh, General, how close, in your view, did the Israelis come to saying they were mad as hell and they weren't going to take this anymore? Very close, believe me, because I was down there being paraded around from uh, general officer to general officer, getting beat up and uh, the, uh, hearing them vent their, their frustration and not being able to attack, uh, especially the uh, Air Force generals. Uh, they wanted to go badly. Yeah. I think part of the problem was uh, the air defense uh, is part of the Air Force in the Israeli Army, and the air defenders had now become heroes. And uh, there were more young Israeli kids that wanted to join the Air Force but be air defenders, patriot guys, rather than pilots. So I think the pilots were extremely angry at this. Uh, everything you saw around the, uh, uh, Israel was patriot. Patriot ice cream cones, patriot this, patriot that. <laughs> Even patriot condoms were advertised. <laughs> uh, and, and the patriot That's soldiers... That's a scary thought. Ours, <laughs> it really, it is. It is. Yes. You know, our, our patriot soldiers there were treated like, uh, like kings and queens there, and, and, and the Israeli patriot soldiers were hailed as, uh, uh, as heroes. And, and it sort of added to the, uh, I think, to some of the frustration and anger of uh, the pilots who were always... Well, in that case, they went to the right guy. I mean, the Marines have a brilliant sense of public relations. All you have to do is tell them what the Marines do. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> yeah. Still thinking about the patriot condoms. All right. <laughs> Prevent dangerous penetration. Well, the collapse of the... The FCC may be watching. I don't care if we're only on cable. The, the collapse of the Soviet Union came with a whimper. The bangs came later almost always in unexpected places, as unexpected as the actual end of the empire. No one had predicted it. It happened so fast that even the most savvy foreign policy and intelligence professionals failed to get a handle on the specific events, much less to grasp their bigger picture implications. Give us a little uh, Monday morning quarterbacking, Tom Clancy, on that uh, momentous time and uh, what we have or have not learned well. Oh, God, the best story I have for that was when they, they tried to do the coup to, to uh, knock off Gorbachev and reestablish the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. A couple months earlier, there was a thing on like page 16 of the Washington Post that, um, that Gorbachev had canceled history exams all through the Soviet Union, saying that there is no sense in testing their knowledge of lies. And I just thought, click. No high school kid will ever forget being excused a semester exam. And so I called Alex Koss, the, the, the gal who did the book, Stepping Down from the Star. I said, Alex, does this mean what I think it means? And she says, yeah. The Post didn't see the significance of it, but they're, they're only reporters, what do they know? Uh, <laughs> and I, and I, I, that, that popped back into my head two years later, in, in, 1990, in August of 1991, I thought, the kids who 
got excused their semester exams and are now carrying rifles in Soviet motor rifle divisions. And earlier that year, they had the first elections in the Soviet Union, and the company great officers all voted for Boris Yeltsin. So I'm thinking, the generals are going to think, because they give the orders, the troopies are going to do what the generals say. Well, guess what? Lieutenants voted for somebody else, and the guys carrying the rifles are going to think, this is the guy who excused the semester exam for us because there's no sense in, in learning about lies. I'm thinking, you know, in Paraguay, they run better coups than what, they, what the, the communists tried in, in, in Moscow in 1991. And so I called Fred Francis of NBC News, a pretty smart guy, pretty smart reporter. And I said, Fred, there's two things I want you to check out. And I gave him the, the, the two things. He called back uh, an hour later and said, you're right on both things. I said, okay, Fred, this coup ain't going to work. And he says, how long do you give it? I, I, I give it two weeks. Well, I was overly optimistic. It lasted three days. And so <laughs> the day after the coup failed, NBC sent a satellite truck down to my house. And they interviewed me for the Today Show. And Freddie, Fred Francis, honorable reporter, he's paying off a debt. And the next day, the Washington Post went berserk. What are they asking a novelist for? Because <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm the guy who figured it out, you know. But uh, and that's, 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 that's actually a true story. I didn't make that one up. It's, uh, <laughs> it does happen in fiction. The difference between me and reporters, I do good fiction. But uh, I, said that, I said that a few years ago to the National Press Club. And some of them had the good grace to laugh. But nobody saw it coming. The guy who came close was Bigniew Brzezinski. He was probably the smartest guy in the Carter administration. And I, I, I talked with him um, right before the Soviet Union came unglued. And sure enough, he's a smart guy. And he wrote a good book. And the, he was lucky, but luck counts. And I'm, I'm proof positive that luck really does count. Uh, but... He was the only guy who came close to predicting it, and maybe he, maybe the, the gods of history were, were were good to him. But he was pretty smart, and he, and he saw it coming. The funny thing about that is, 20 years from now, I hope I'm still alive, uh, somebody's going to write a book about how Reagan destroyed the Soviet Union. And it's going to go along the, these general lines. I, I don't know the classified information. I've never seen a classified document in my life, except once in the Pentagon. I, Want to see the outside to see how they're formatted, but I never looked. I've never looked at a classified document. Bill Casey, who was DCI back then, was the mad genius of the Reagan, Reagan administration. He had a great sense of history, and he really, really didn't like the Russians. He's also a Catholic. He had a black C-141 Starlifter airplane that spent a lot of time flying back and forth to and from Andrews Air Force Base to Rome, where he evidently sat down and talked with His Holiness John Paul II. And so John Paul II evidently used the mechanism of the Catholic Church in Eastern Europe to raise little hell within the Warsaw Pact. The Saudi royal family was helping uh, manipulate the price of oil because that's how the Russians got their hard currency. And Reagan told Cap Weinberger to do occasion random crazy things like sending the B-52s to the limit of Russian radar cover and then bring them back. Now we pushed too far on that to the point that Yuri Andropov uh, said to the Politburo at one point that he expected to be in a nuclear war with the United States in 12 months. And we decided to dial it back a little bit. But Ronald Reagan, assisted by Bill Casey, Cap Weinberg, and a few others, and the Pope, and a few other smart people, and the Saudis, decided to destroy the Soviet Union. And it worked. Okay, It really did work. It was a kind of master plan that people write novels about, except this was for real. Now, it's going to take 20 years for, that back, for those documents to be declassified. De for somebody, a, a good historian, a guy of the, say, Sir John Keegan class, to say, here's how they did it. And I hope to live, live long enough to read that book, because it was a masterly job. It's not the sort of thing you associate with the United States of America, because, frankly, our government's not always that smart. We all know that. If you, in fact, have never seen a classified document, how do you get all the stuff that winds up in your books that usually has the CIA and, for that matter, probably the KGB and its successor buzzing? <laughs> One of my fantasies is to see my KGB file. Uh, because, <laughs> there, no, there's no way, there's no way the Russians believe I was just an insurance agent who got lucky. I mean, <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, it's all in the open if you know where to look. And I just play connect the dots. I, would, I probably would have been a pretty good spook. But if you, if, you, if you know this is true and you know that's true, there's something in the middle that's got to be true, too. If you guess what it is, and it's not all that hard, and you figure out what it is. 
That's could what you, spooks do. Could you go to any public library and uh, within a matter of days write a highly classified document just from publicly available information? Oh, it's been done. Now you use the Internet. It's even more efficient. <laughs> Let me ask you about this passage here in the book Battle Ready, General. Thank God, Americans sighed, the Cold War is over. The big world will take care of itself. We no longer need the vast, powerful military presence that kept the evil empire checked. Peace will bring incredible material dividends. Now we can go about our smaller, private business and go on with our personal lives. Everybody is going to be secure and happy. I was dumb enough to believe that, too. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh... I was in Europe when the, uh, when the wall came down, and uh, every, uh, everybody talked about the new world order and the peace dividend. And we were watching uh, our military presence in, in Europe coming down, people talking about NATO no longer being uh, viable or necessary. Uh, but unfortunately, what we were seeing was the new world disorder coming up. Uh, and we were beginning to see uh, problems around the world, uh, emergencies uh, and non-combatant evacuations in Africa, humanitarian problems, peacekeeping issues that uh, sort of had been tamped down during the Cold War because both sides had some control or, or at least pumped resources in because it was a zero-sum game. Everybody wanted every little country on their side and nation or tribe and so was willing to pay them off uh, to keep him there. Now nobody was willing to, to pay for these. And there were some uh, ethnic, religious, uh, tribal issues that were held in check that suddenly now, like in the Balkans, were popping up. So we sensed that this was not going to be that clean and that uh, we had a Cold War military that needed to adjust to this and we'd better be careful about thinking too much about peace dividends and a new world order that would order itself that there was go it was going to take some tending to uh, these issues around the world. But we seem, uh, we seem distracted and onto other things. And unfortunately, we went through, then through a whole series of events and problems. Had we taken different action, we might have shaped the world a little bit differently. And now we see the results of them. You have described the United States as having become an empire of influence. What do you mean by that? Well, we're not an empire of conquest, uh, like many in history. We are the most powerful nation of the world. We are, whether we like it or not, the most influential nation in the world. Uh, because of that, because of our power, because of our influence, in many ways we are resented, sometimes hated, admired, liked, envied around the world. I sometimes don't think we understand how powerful we, we are and how much, even without trying, we influence other cultures and other parts of the world how much the rest of the world depends on us or looks to us to help them in situations uh, that sometimes we don't feel uh, the, the necessity uh, of that assistance or aid. Uh, they look for leadership from the United States and sometimes uh, we don't provide it uh, or we're not conscious of the need or the understanding that uh, we're the only ones that can provide that. Uh, in many parts of the world, you find that whatever problem they face or thinks it, it's the greatest, they are convinced that only the United States can resolve that. For example, if, if you were to talk to anybody in the Middle East and ask them what is the single greatest problem in that region, they will virtually all say it is the Arab-Israeli conflict or the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. And then if you followed it up by saying who can resolve it, they would say only the United, United States. Uh, and this is what I mean by uh, an empire of influence. Uh, you know, we, we have to understand how to use that influence constructively and the power of that influence. Uh, you know, it, it isn't uh, the Roman Empire or the British Empire of the 19th century. We, we haven't achieved this through conquest. It is a very different kind of empirical power. The San Diego Union Tribune of April 16th had an article in which you are quoted as wondering aloud how Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld could be caught off guard by the chaos in Iraq. And they quote you directly, I'm surprised that he is surprised because there was a lot of us who were telling him that it was going to be thus. Anyone could know the problems they were going to see. How could they not? Unquote you. Care to elaborate? Yeah, I think not only me, but uh, several previous commanders of U.S. Central Command. Uh, we understood what it would mean to try to reconstruct Iraq. Uh, we were alarmed by 
the descriptions of the threat as being imminent. We didn't see it that way. I saw the intelligence right up uh, to the beginning of the war. I didn't see an imminent threat. Uh, we were concerned about a strategy that, uh, uh, that we felt, I felt, was flawed. The idea you're going to change the Middle East by going in and suddenly uh, uh, ferry dusting Jeffersonian democracy on the Iraqis and, and suddenly the entire Middle East would change was ridiculous. Uh, we could see us uh, going in without pursuing what had been done under President Bush 41, you know, the tremendous diplomatic effort to get a U.N. resolution to build a coalition to share the burden, uh, to bring international legitimacy to your effort. We couldn't understand the rush to war. Uh, as we saw the brilliant performance of our military on the ground, we worried why we didn't get the same brilliant performance in the political reconstruction, economic reconstruction. The coalition provisional authority was a pickup team. There was no real planning for this. It was a series of mistakes uh, from disbanding the army to debathifying too deeply to beaming in the ex Exiles that we fell in love with, the Gucci guerrillas from London, that you can read in the paper the effects of all that. And, and this just, you know, uh, to us watch this unfold and to know this was all, to use a term from the Secretary of Defense, this was a knowable uh, uh, known th that uh, everybody should have been aware of going in. To suddenly say we were surprised by all this, there wasn't that much fog or friction to this war. Uh, this should have been handled much better. And it's caused some of us to speak out. Did your tongue... <laughs> Did your tongue have anything to do with your departure from uh, the military? Oh, no. I, uh, unbelievably, my tongue hasn't hurt my career uh, in, any, in any way. I, I worked for some remarkable people in my life that insisted that uh, if I had a gripe or a complaint or a point of view, it had better be expressed. As a matter of fact, the kinds of people I worked for, both civilian and military, uh, told me that uh, if, if I ever left uh, with having bitten my tongue as opposed to expressing my views, uh, I would be long gone. Uh, whether I agreed or not, they wanted to uh, hear it. Uh, there's an example I give in the book. Uh, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff when I was the commander at Central Command was Hugh Shelton, Army Four-Star General Hugh Shelton. Hugh Shelton sent all of us four-star commanders, service chiefs and unified command commanders, he sent us the book Dereliction of Duty. It was written by, uh, at that time, a young Army major, brilliant Army major named McMasters, H.R. McMasters, and it was about the dereliction of the Joint Chiefs of Staff during the Vietnam War, that they knew there were flawed policies and mistakes, but they didn't speak out. Hugh Shelton made us all read that book, and then he called us all to Washington for a session. We had breakfast with H.R. Uh, uh, McMasters, who explained what happened. And the message from Hugh Shelton and from the Secretary of Defense, uh, Bill Cohen, was, don't you ever sit on your hand and be quiet if you feel something is wrong. The door is always open up here. And don't you ever neglect your duty to speak to Congress, because that's an obligation, too, if you feel a policy is wrong from here. But they did not ever want us to walk away saying that we felt something was wrong and not right and didn't have uh, the guts to, to come in and to present it to them directly. So, I mean, that's the kind of influence I had uh, about speaking out and presenting what you felt was right or wrong. And uh, it's the way I grew up. Tom Clancy, you have taken some heat because of this book, Battle Ready, from quarters uh, where you normally get uh, pretty solid support, conservative talk radio. I'm not going to work at all. I worked up over Sean Hannity, but uh, do go on. <laughs> Did I hear the name Sean Hannity mentioned? Who? Sorry. <laughs> Suffice it to say you've, you've taken some heat. Your thoughts about that from whatever quarter? Hey, the first thing, Oliver, Mr. Justice Holmes used to write that the First Amendment is not designed to protect speech with which you agree, but to protect speech which you hate. And if people don't agree with me, fine. Let them tell me how they think I'm wrong, and I'll, I'll listen to them too. But freedom of speech means you say what you think and you, you stand by your positions. You know, Tony wrote this book. Real, more so, I was more an editor than anything else. And I'll back Tony up everything he says. I'm not going to dispute one of the things this Marine says. We have been told that the attack on Iraq a year ago was a prime example of the new, leaner, meaner, lighter military. Whether or not that's true, did we have enough troops when we went in, and do we have enough troops now, General? 
it, we certainly had enough troops to defeat the organized resistance of, uh, that the Iraqi military presented, the Republican Guard, the regular army. Uh, th that was not the problem. I agreed with, uh, and my plan when I was commander of U.S. Central Command was more in line with General Shinseki, uh, who knew a lot about this business since he was director of operations for the Army during my time at CENTCOM, chief of staff of the Army, and had had experience in Kosovo in running these kinds of operations. We felt you needed more troops on the ground initially, not to beat the Republican Guard, but to deal with the vacuum that was going to be created as soon as you ripped the heart out of an authoritarian regime and the secret police, the Mukhabarat, uh, the Fedayeen, the, uh, the Republican Guard, Special Republican Guard were all gone now. And you could now end up with chaos, with lawlessness, with revenge killings, with faction on faction. Uh, you can end up uh, w with a society that's unsure where the authority comes from and the security comes from. You had to protect borders to prevent those coming in from outside that would try to influence the outcome of what you were trying to reconstruct or develop. You had to control road networks. You had to control infrastructure. You had to protect people uh, and, and resources that were going to be needed for reconstruction. And so our plan had more divisions. Uh, I would love to say that the answer to all this is high technology, high speed, low drag kinds of capabilities. Unfortunately, it's a bunch of grunts with boots. They may be infantry, light infantry, military police, but you need them in numbers to do this kind of work. Uh, victory isn't the day you defeat the enemy's organized resistance. Victory is when you finally put in place uh, something that's lasting. Compare World War I with World War II. We defeated the enemy in World War I, clearly. We didn't leave behind something that, uh, that had a lasting peace. We were doomed to repeat World War II. At the end of World War II, where we again defeated the enemy, the, most, the greatest generation of magnificent feat of military arms, we then followed it up with the Marshall Plan, the creation of NATO. We changed the conditions in Europe and, and, and uh, the Far East. And therefore, we have now very stable societies out there and didn't repeat the chronic wars that stretched back from the 19th century into a Europe that had to be changed from monarchy, monarchies and a colonial system and militarism into what it is now. Looking ahead, again, quoting from the book Battle Ready, this whole new world, and this is talking about what happened after the collapse of the Soviet Union and how the, the big power battle had dominated the second half of the 20th century. This whole new world was simmering underneath the Cold War, and we've had to meet this challenge unprepared. We should have gone full throttle into a visionary program like the Marshall Plan that would have injected energy, education, money, and hope into the third world. Nothing like that happened. Thoughts, Tom Clancy? Oh, God, do I name names? Um, yes. Right after the Soviet Union went down, I was at some political uh, soiree here in D.C., and Phyllis Schlafly was there, and, and it looked like the Soviet Union was going to have a bad time feeding itself. And, and she made the observation, that we'll sell them food for gold. And I said, Phyllis, they still have 10,000 nuclear warheads pointed at us. We don't want this country to have a civil war right now, do we? I mean, the fundamental problem here is the difference in worldview. The politicians, like kind of like Paramount Pictures or Hollywood in general, they think of the, the world as being digital. The world is not digital. The world is analog. The world is fundamentally untidy. And you have to have enough people to handle the untidy parts. You know, kind of like washing cars. You can't do it with a machine, much as they try. If you want to put a fire out, it's not just dumping water on the fire. It's sending firemen in there to kill the sources of the fire and to keep the fire out. The world is an untidy place, and if we think it's going to change, we're wrong. The reason communism failed was they thought they had a magic formula and they could change human nature. Wah! You know, that, 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 that show we go to double jeopardy now. It's, uh, human nature hasn't changed in 5,000 years. And unless we address these little things in our foreign policy, foreign policy is going to fail. Looking at that very issue, really the, the crux of, of a lot of, of what we're going to be facing and of what most everybody in this room will be facing for the rest of their lives, maybe our children will see a time when that isn't the case. Uh, I've, I've heard it put this way, that, that there was a reformation that occurred in Christianity. No such reformation has occurred in Islam. And as long as we have 
people who are willing to crank out suicide bombers from a population of undereducated, underskilled young people who feel no particular uh, allegiance to this life because it doesn't seem to offer them a great deal, we're going to be facing this problem. All the while, the nation states where this emanates uh, will be continuing their march toward acquiring uh, ballistic missiles to deliver chemical, biological, and nuclear weapons. Uh, more and more countries are going to be going the North Korean direction, in some cases with the help of the North Koreans. Now, we can either sit back and wait for that to happen and possibly face a real World War III, or we can do something now. What do we do now, General? Well, uh, I think you hit the nail on the head in that this is a battle for the souls of the young generation in the Islamic world. Uh, they are flocking in, in alarming numbers to causes and ideologies like uh, Al-Qaeda and, and Osama bin Laden's organization uh, and are willing to die uh, because there's something that makes living worse. It's, uh, if you look at the root causes, it, and, and it's not just uneducated young men and women, it's educated. We saw in those 9-11 uh, 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 hijackers, we saw some very well-educated people. Uh, unfortunately, there is either a political, economic, or social condition that uh, has put them over the top. And they're easy fodder for the extremists like Osama bin Laden and others uh, to warp them, to, to uh, give them a, a rationale. The rationale is an aberrant, twisted form of Islam. Uh, and so that serves as, uh, to, to give them justification to sacrifice their lives. Uh, usually it is done because there's some anger for one of the political, economic, or social reasons that drive them to, to that, to, to do it. And I think what has to happen is a series of things. The countries that are faced with this problem, and you can see what's happening now in Saudi Arabia uh, and elsewhere, they need to deal with this. We, they need to deal with the kinds of reforms uh, that, uh, that correct these problems that are affecting this young generation. They need to not only uh, put these reforms in place, they need to create within this great Abrahamic religion a dialogue. It needs to go through its reformation. Uh, it needs to go through its rena renaissance or enlightenment, much like the other Abrahamic religions have gone through. They need to square with the 21st century, with modernity, uh, with governance uh, versus religion, and how they work th that out in a way that, that's acceptable and, 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 and isn't confusing. There needs to be this Islamic dialogue, and it needs to be encouraged and and the, and the venues and the fora for this need to be given by the moderate leadership in this part of the world, or it's going to be too late for them. We can help. There are certain things we can do in this region. I mean, th again, uh, there are the kinds of things that we can do economically and in terms of security. Uh, you mentioned education. Our educational system is extremely valued in this part of the world. We're about to see a change in Iran. The younger generation is basically rejecting fundamentalism and clerical rule. They can't quite figure out how to do it and change it, but slowly and surely it's going to come about. If you think about it, if Osama bin Laden won and he, and, he, and he ended up deciding that he was going to convince the youth in the Islamic world to go back to the 14th century and to live under clerical rules, rule, it would be rejected eventually. It couldn't last. It, it couldn't stand up in, in the information age and in, in, in the face of modernity and what it has to offer. Uh, you know, so it is much like communism. It is a failed I ideology to begin with. But the immediate battle will be for the souls of these uh, young uh, men and women in this part of the world. Given the size of the audience here, I'd like to allow a little extra time for questions tonight. So as I address a final question to Tom Clancy, you will notice on either side of the aisles there a microphone and a microphone. And if you have a question or comment for our guests, uh, please go to those positions if you would. And uh, we'll get to you here. Tom Clancy, is it more fun to write fiction or nonfiction? Well, nice thing about nonfiction, I let him do all the work. But um, <laughs> uh, I write fiction because uh, the difference between fiction and reality is fiction has to make sense. Does it have to? I mean, uh, Lewis Carroll didn't make sense. I mean, your fiction makes sense, but it wouldn't automatically have to, would it? Well, it does if I write it. <laughs> You go to, to great lengths uh, in terms of research, but honest to goodness, you know, if, uh, if there was a, 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 a Phillips head screw on a certain screw on a Scud missile, we wouldn't know the difference if it was just an ordinary uh, screw head. But if head. it does, I have to describe it because it's, it's the truth. So in other words, it, it's, it's your own standard. Not, the rest of us, we'd still buy the, the novel. We'd when I was a kid, it. my father told me, like he told everybody else in this room, 
If you're going to do the job, do it right or don't do it at all. I got that from my dad. Fair enough. Let's take some uh, questions and comments from the audience at this time. We'll start uh, of necessity over here. Go ahead. Uh, Jim McDonald from Alexandria, Virginia. Get a little closer, could you, to the mic? Oh, okay. Thank Jim you. McDonald, Alexandria, Virginia. Uh, all the money, we've been spending a lot of money on the war on Iraq, and we could have alternatively spent that on strengthening our Canadian and Mexican borders. Uh, which might have been a better investment of those funds with respect to the security of Americans living in the USA? Spending it on Iraq or spending it on the borders? Tony? Well, I, th I don't think it's an either or. Uh, I mean, protecting your borders is, is anti-terrorism. It's the defensive or security measures you need, to uh, you need to take to protect yourself. But at the same time, you have to take the war to the enemy. Now, I happen to, to believe that the war against terrorism shouldn't have led us to Baghdad. Certainly, uh, you know, we can see that hasn't panned out. We should have paid more attention to Kabul and, uh, uh, and, the, and the northern territories, and we could have uh, done better to, to pursue them there. Those were the perpetrators of 9-11. But in a broader sense, the problems of the, the, the Islamic world, if you will, the Middle East, Southeast Asia, and elsewhere uh, have to be dealt with. Or you can, you're going to waste a lot, not waste a lot of money, but you're going to consume a lot of your resources always being on defense. You know, so it, it, you can't just do one. It's not just a matter of spending all your money on protection. You're going to have to eliminate the sources of the problem. Uh, Dr. Rice, Condoleezza Rice said it correctly. Uh, they only have to be right, get it right once. We have to get it right every single time. I, when I was in Israel, you could see the frustration of the Shin Bet, their version of the FBI. They managed to stop short probably 9 to 15 attacks for every one that gets through. And they're crushed by the one that gets through. And, and anybody with that kind of batting record, you know, you would think would be really proud. But the one always tears them up that, that gets through. Uh, so unless you deal with the sources of it as well as a, a protective measures and you have that balance, I don't think you're going to resolve the problem. And as a follow-up to that, did you have something you wanted to say, Tom? Yeah. One thing America must, must, must do is to improve our intelligence gathering capabilities. Back in the 70s, we destroyed the CIA clandestine service. Those are the field spooks who go out and talk to people, find out what they're thinking, and get the information back to the home office. The FBI infiltrated the mafia. Uh, an agent, special agent named Joe Pistone wrote a book about it called Donnie Brasco, My Life in the Mafia. That's precisely what the CIA has got to do with these fellows. Get out and talk to them and find out what they think and get the information back to Langley. It's going to take us years to get this done. It takes, and we just had a, a case in the U.S. Senate where, where Director Tenet said it's going to take five years to, to, to build the service back up. And some senator exercised his brain a little bit and said, well, what if we, we, don't, what if we don't have five years? Well, my wife just made me richer by a daughter. And it took her nine months to deliver the baby. Three women can't do it in three months. <laughs> right. Some things just take time. And you invest the time. Because otherwise, it'll never get done. And never can be a long, miserable time. But we don't need 9 11 to... happened because we didn't know those bastards were coming. You got to go get the right people out of the field and find out what they're up to. That means spooks. Now, a lot of people in Congress think, oh, they do bad things. Well, maybe they do, but they're damn useful bad things. But we don't need field agents. We have satellites that can read license plates from orbit, he said. Well, they actually, they can't, but what the hell. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that is a viewpoint that you, you do hear. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, and uh, as a quick follow-up, and then back to our questions from the audience, have we reached a point in our history where the whole... Uh, philosophy of, I guess it's posse comitatus, of preventing the military from engaging in domestic law enforcement. Is that passe? Do we now have a need for U.S. troops on our borders, General? I, I think the federal forces, we've always given the president authority to waive posse comitatus uh, and, and, and to use federal forces when it was required for domestic problems. When I was out in, uh, when I commanded the 1st Marine Expeditionary Force at Camp Pendleton, California, I had to keep two battalions trained to fight fo uh, forest fires, wildfires. Uh, I had uh, Marines that were deployed in the counter-drug operations within the United States. 
I had uh, Marines deployed on border security with the Border Patrol uh, along the southwest border. Uh, we deployed Marines up to Los Angeles uh, during the Rodney King riots. So, I mean, it, in our history, we've always used federal forces when needed, when uh, the local forces, state forces were not enough or the, uh, the activation of the National Guard by the governor. And in, I think now it may be even more so because we bring certain capabilities. Uh, if we have to deal with a chemical or biological <coughs> event, you're, you're going to need the capabilities that federal forces have. So I don't think it's unusual. I don't think we're going to see our borders shoulder to shoulder, uh, you know, in, in that level of security. But we could bring some technical things and support uh, in to do that. And we have provisions for that. Yes. Uh, gentlemen, would you think that uh, Islam is now the biggest problem in the foreseeable future? For instance, um, for many years, I understood that China, for instance, would be our next great opponent. Uh, but now that the Reds are in the black, they seem to be our friends. Uh, is, this, is this the new world order? It's just a few crazies that we have to worry about anymore if things improve that much? One thing we may not do in America is to regard religion as our enemy. The First Amendment to the Constitution, they keep trying to rewrite, rewrite it as freedom from religion. No, it's not. It's freedom of religion. Respect for religion is one of our most important principles. We may not deviate from that. The United States of America, we don't do that here. Period. You know, I would say that, that the greatest threat that this extremism poses is actually to the Islamic world, more so than us. I mean, obviously, you know, we've been through 9-11, and that was horrific. Uh, but... It is now dawning on many of the leaders in the Islamic world that they are at greatest risk. They are in danger of losing control of their country. They are in danger of having their societies and their cultures set back in time. Uh, and they are in danger of the violence you're seeing now go on in places like Saudi Arabia and elsewhere. Uh, and I think you're beginning to see now a realization that the heart and soul of correcting this problem has to be their ability to deal with it. We can certainly help, but the reforms and the changes and the dialogue and, uh, uh, that needs to take place uh, religiously, uh, the, the political changes need to come from them. Uh, if you look at some countries, like some of the small Gulf states, you begin to see this realization hit home where you're now seeing political reform, where, where parliaments are, are being created, where the emirs and others are passing authority, full authority over to the parliaments for, for that decision, where uh, minorities, where, where women are getting the right, not only the right to vote, but the right to run for office, where you're seeing uh, uh, women like uh, uh, the, the spouses of the leaders take up the cause of, of women's rights and, and begin to change. It's going to be a very difficult process because there's all sorts of things that they have to get through, religious, cultural, and other things to adjust to it, uh, uh, to the to problems of modernity, uh, but only they could do it, and they are at the greatest risk and threat for this. This is, in my mind, the most immediate threat, this, this extremism, this radicalism. Uh, it is not as bad as the Cold War. Let's not forget that. I mean, Tom just talked about all those nuclear-tipped weapons that were pointed to us and we had pointed uh, to them. We have stepped back from that abyss, uh, and that's remarkable. This, I, I would tell you, in about a decade, we will resolve this. When I say we, all those that are threatened, not just us in the West, but uh, the countries that are threatened out there, too. It is going to be a difficult patch to go through to get there. But we've been through this before. In the 1980s, terrorism was a significant problem in Europe. Red Brigades, Beider Meinhof gangs, I mean, it, it was rampant in Europe, and they got through that. And we're going to have to go through the same thing. It's much more violent now, much more uh, complicated, but I do think we will get through this. We now need to clean up our act and get the collective cooperative approach we need as a globe to deal with this. Over here. Um, I have a question for, for both gentlemen, uh, actually two <laughs> questions. General, um, if... Uh, Donald Rumsfeld uh, asked you for pictures that were taken at a particular place, and um, I would like to know how long it would take you to get them to him. And Tom, I'd like to know, uh, when you curl up with a good novel, who do you read? <laughs> good. Well, Donald Rumsfeld doesn't ask me for much. Uh, <laughs> 
and I'm not sure which pictures you're talking about. Was it my high school graduation or? Uh, it, it, I would tell you if I take your question to me about satellite imagery and that sort of you know intelligence kinds of things. Uh, uh, I felt I had tremendous su support in CENTCOM. I'll go back to the point uh, that was made by Jim about technical intelligence collection. We're very good at it. We listen and we look and we take pictures and uh, we're very good at all that. What we lack is what Tom brought up is the ability to interpret what we're seeing. And the only way you know intentions is you got to get inside the other guy's decision-making organization. You need somebody on the inside. You need to penetrate it so that I can make sense out, out of what I'm seeing. Uh, so the ability to, uh, uh, to get what I would call order of battle intelligence is very good. The ability to understand what's going on and why you're seeing what you're seeing is not very good. And, and I would echo what Tom said. I heard this from uh, uh, Director Tennant, too, that if, if we really wanted him to establish a major human capability, say, in the part of the world that I was responsible for, it was going to take a lot of hundreds of millions of dollars and about five to six years to even get some kind of credible organization on the ground because we've stripped ourselves of that capability over time. As far as uh, curling up with a good book, uh, you look like the, the Pippi Longstocking type to me, Tom. <laughs> Actually, it's more like uh, Harry Potter, but uh, she writes better than I do anyway. But uh, actually, I'm, mainly I read history, and the, the the one probably the best military historian in the world right now is Sir John Keegan. And an, a rising star, and the, the Brits turn out uh, good historians the same way Budweiser punches out bottles of beer. And the, a, a new guy who, who um, has impressed the hell out of me is uh, you ever read Neil Ferguson. Mm -hmm. He's going to be a star. I mean, he is. He wrote a book on World War One called "The Pity of War," which I it was an, a pro, an approach to studying the war I'd never seen before. He did a beautiful job. He lives evidently lives somewhere in New York. Now, next time I go to New York, I'm going to try to look him up and have a beer with him. There are, but I, I, more than anything else, I read history. I watch the History Channel, and I like good information. I don't read fiction when I'm trying to write fiction or something. My brain prevents that from happening. It's terrible. Yes, over here. These last two questions. Okay, the, these will be the last two, right? Uh, right I'm, here. I'm, I'm Jim Myrna from Lanham, Maryland. I, I have a personal question for General Zinni. General Zinni, in your early days as a young PLC candidate, officer candidate at Villanova, did you ever dream in your wildest imagination that you would rise to the rank of general officer, assume major commands, and uh, end up briefing the President of the United States? What, what, what were your hopes, and dreams, and ambitions in those days, uh, and, and what advice would you have for the young fighting man of today? Uh, and one other point, uh, like you, I'm, I'm a former Marine, Korean War vintage, and I, I, like you, I'm the proud dad of an active duty Marine officer today. Great. Uh, at that time, I wasn't sure I was going to graduate, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I hate to tell you the story of how I joined the Marines, uh, because it was purely by accident. I w I'm the only member of my family, or the first member that went to college. Uh, my father sat me down and he said, I was, and I'm the baby by far, and he said, I, we might be able to afford uh, tuition. You're going to have to figure out how you go to school. You're going to have to work your way through school. I didn't go away to college. I had to commute every day and work. And uh, so I had to, working with the good sisters at uh, St. Matthew's High School, figure out how I applied to college. I had no concept of this whole thing. And uh, the first day on campus, I was a very confused, young, just turned 18-year-old kid uh, and wandering around the campus. And some guy told me, another freshman checking in, that uh, when you go to college, you have to join the military. And I believed him. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they told me there was an NROTC program and you had to take courses in, you know, engineering and all this stuff. Look, and I was what was called a Villanova Comics and Frolics. It was commerce and finance, you know, it was just to get a degree. And so I thought, man, how do you do this? I have no concept. And as I was going through trying to register for my classes, I walked into the, the student cafeteria and there were these three Marines in their dress blues, officers with some posters. And so I walked up and I said, uh, I want to join. And they looked at me and they said, what exactly do you want to join? <laughs> and I said, uh, 
look, I don't got a lot of time here. I've got to get to my next uh, class. And so I think they sensed they had a live one. And, uh, they signed me up for the platoon leaders uh, class, the PLC program. I had no concept what I signed up for. Uh, when I came home from my first day of college, my dear old Italian mother met me in the doorway and said, how was college your first day? I said, great, I joined the Marines. <laughs> and she almost passed out, and my, my father and big brother had to try to sort out what I had done, and I had no clue. And the first clue came when I got my orders in the summer to go to Quantico. Uh, I, uh, I picked up a brochure on Quantico. Unfortunately, it was a special services brochure which showed the boating and the yachts and the golf course. And, all that. <laughs> and a gunnery sergeant who made me, met me at the train station quickly changed uh, uh, what was about to happen. And I went through that first session, which amounts, as you know, to, to boot camp. Uh, and I barely made it through on probation that first summer. So uh, my idea that I would be here uh, certainly wasn't formed at that time. <laughs> <laughs> you turned out okay. <laughs> and uh, a final question over here. Uh, sir, my name is Mason New from Alexander, Virginia. I'm a former corporal in the Marine Corps myself, and I was wondering what your opinion on the uh, prisoner situation at Abu Ghraib uh, prison in Iraq is uh, specifically concerning the enlisted uh, men and women who are charged and the issues surrounded with that. <clears throat> well, I, first of all, I think we ought to not speculate on the, the heart of the problem. Let the investigations and the inquiries, and certainly there are plenty of them, root out what happened. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's it, obviously we have to be, as an open society, we have to admit the mistakes. We have to be open about them. We, ne we need the world to see our justice system work to show that uh, we can make mistakes and we're human, but we will deal with them and we'll deal with them openly. And, and that, in some ways, through an unfortunate incident, could be an opportunity to show who we are. There's, there's possibilities as to what happened here. It could be, as some people say, a few bad apples. It could be, and certainly is, I'm sure, a failure of leadership. Great NCOs like you and staff NCOs and young officers should have been down there supervising and not let this happen. Uh, it could be that there's a policy that was put out that led people to believe this was appropriate behavior. But these are could be's. And I don't think we should speculate on what it is now. Let the course of the investigations, aren't the Army two-star general that did his investigation did a, a great and honest uh, investigation. There'll be more, and there'll be congressional inquiries, and obviously the press will be all over this. The truth will come out, and we ought to deal with it when it comes out. But we shouldn't begin to, and we shouldn't decide now how far up it goes or where it lies or what's the cause. We should be preparing ourselves to deal with the cause, but not speculate, let it come out, and then deal with it, in my view. Very good. I believe that uh, we will have the opportunity for book signing to occur. Is that correct? Outside, as you go out, you'll be directed to the appropriate place. You've been a very perceptive audience. We've had two magnificent guests. I have you.